America celebrated its first Earth Day in 1970. It came about in part because of this image. It's called Earthrise, and it's known as the photo that inspired the environmental movement because it was such a vivid reminder that we live on a beautiful and delicate planet. It was taken during the Apollo 8 mission in 1968. The next year, we got a vivid reminder of a very different kind when downtown in a major American city, the river caught on fire. When the Cuyahoga burned in Cleveland, it drove home the fact that we had serious environmental problems. Earth Day combined the themes of these two images, that we had a vulnerable and precious planet and that we were screwing it up. Around the time of the festival, at the dawn of the environmental movement, a few ideas took shape. That there were too many of us, that we were consuming too much and polluting too much, that we were going to run out of resources and suffer greatly as a result. Um, hey, by the way, do you think a title like Famine 1975 really needs an exclamation point? <laughs> A lot of these ideas are still with us today, and they shape how we think about our relationship with our planet. If you looked at the evidence, if you looked at the trends in 1970, you actually would have found a lot of support for these gloomy views. Our population was growing steadily, and our economy, the size of our total consumption, was growing even more quickly. We were getting wealthier, and we liked it. We liked our prosperity. We liked our comforts. We liked our stuff we didn't show any signs of changing course. And to generate all this prosperity and all this stuff, we took more and more resources from the planet every year. More metal, more fertilizer, more minerals, more water, more energy, more and more steadily, year after year, of all the things that yielded our prosperity. We built an economy that did exactly what it was designed to do, grow voraciously, relentlessly, and apparently at the expense of everything else. And in our mania for growth, we made some terrible mistakes. We let our rivers catch on fire. We blanketed our cities in smog. We killed all the passenger pigeons. We damn near killed all the buffalo, bear, wolves, and whales. Our mistakes kept coming, and they kept compounding and it felt like planetary death by a thousand cuts. Earth Day was a plea for us to stop this insanity. Otherwise, we were going to flat run out. We were going to choke and starve ourselves and our planet to death. We had to walk away from this mania for growth and embrace a philosophy of degrowth. So, did we? Have we Americans turned our backs on prosperity and consumption <laughs> and wholeheartedly embraced degrowth? No, no, we have not. To see this, let's keep looking at the trends. Since 1970, our population has continued to increase very steadily, and our economy, again, our total consumption, has continued to increase much more quickly. We keep making stuff and buying stuff and driving vehicles and eating meals and doing all the things that make up a modern economy. We have not embraced degrowth. We have continued to embrace growth growth. But something fundamental did change, something that really nobody was anticipating, and that even today, very, very few people are aware of. Even as we kept growing more and more year after year, eventually, we started taking less and less from the planet. Less metal, less fertilizer, fewer minerals, less water, fewer trees. I have some extraordinarily good news to report. In America, we are finally past peak paperwork. I find this one really weird. We're probably actually past peak energy. And look what's happened to pollution. It has not been this low for a century.
And I want to stress, all of these resource lines include everything we buy from China and other countries and everything we recycle. So they really do tell the whole story. And it's an unbelievable story. Something extraordinary has happened. For the first time in human history, we have decoupled output growth from resource consumption. That was way too much economist speak. Let me say the same thing a different way. We have finally figured out how to give ourselves more and more while taking less and less from the planet. So how did we accomplish this? How did we pull off this unbelievable, unanticipated feat? To get an answer, we have to turn to the obvious source, a Radio Shack ad from 1991. I'm serious, this actually tells us something really important because all of these devices, 11 out of the 13 featured in this ad, have basically vanished into the modern smartphone. <laughs> this is a great example of the phenomenon of dematerialization. Dematerialization is simply the ability to consume the things we want, in this case, media, communications, computing, while using fewer resources, fewer molecules from the world, in some cases, none at all. Now, dematerialization does not happen because we spontaneously give up the desire to consume and embrace the philosophy of degrowth. It doesn't happen because we're noble. It happens because we're cheap. <laughs> It's very simple. Resources cost money that we would rather not spend and technological progress offers us an alternative to that spending. So, instead of buying a computer and a hard drive and a landline and an answering machine and a camcorder and a camera and a Walkman and a tape... We just buy one tiny phone. Once you're aware of dematerialization, you start to see it all over the place. How many of us still have extensive VHS tape libraries? How many of us still use a bulky CRT monitor? It's not just digital and high-tech products. Cars today use less metal and less gas. Telecommunication networks use a lot less copper. And farming is very quickly giving way to precision agriculture, where harvests go up while cropland, water, and fertilizer all go down. Dematerialization is happening all over the place, in big ways and small ways in obvious ways and subtle ways. It's the best environmental news in the world, and for our planet, it's life by a thousand cuts. So, now that we are all evidence-loving, technology-loving, eco-modernists, what do we need to do? How do we keep this amazing trend going of getting more and more from less and less? Three things. First of all, We need to be vigilant about pollution. Businesses will dump waste into the environment if it's costless for them to do so, so we have to make it costly with smart regulation and tough enforcement. Second, we really need to stop cooking the planet. <laughs> Greenhouse gases are an especially tough kind of pollution because they come from so many of our activities everything from generating electricity, to driving cars, to raising animals. So we need a wide range of solutions. The good news is we have them. We have amazing progress with renewables. We have super promising research with everything from batteries to geoengineering to lab-grown meat. We have the nuclear option, and we should use it. I like the way Bill Gates frames the issue. He says, we desperately need an energy miracle in the 21st century, and we might just get one. The third thing we have to do is the most controversial and the most counterintuitive. We have to help the rest of the world get rich. <laughs> This is the exact opposite of the advice we've been hearing since Earth Day, which is about the urgent need for degrowth. That advice is really well-meaning, but we now know that it's wrong. It is not prosperity that's the enemy of the environment. It's poverty. 
And it's not degrowth that's going to rescue us. It's dematerialization. Look, I am not a Pollyanna. I know that we face serious challenges, no shortage of them. And I don't believe that technology is pixie dust. It's just going to magically make everything better for all of us. But I also know that sometimes we have to take yes for an answer. Yes, we have finally built an economy that gives us more and more while letting us tread more and more lightly on the earth. Yes, we are fixing our past mistakes. Our rivers do not catch on fire anymore. And yes, we can build a world that takes better care of all of us and better care of our fellow creatures. In fact, we already are. The buffalo are back. <laughs> the wolves and the bear are coming back. I started this talk with Earthrise, which is now my second favorite environmental image of all time. I want to end with my absolute favorite, and I love it because it shows me what we have already been able to accomplish and what we're going to see more and more of in the future. It is a picture taken in 2014 of a humpback whale off the coast of New York City. <laughs> Good for us. Thank you.